Is there a way to give a woman an instant orgasm? Then we take a brief look at a political scandal that rocked South Korea and the ramifications it has for conspiracy theorists today. And then we end with a trip into the ocean. Are octopuses actually from outer space? Scientists think they might be. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rev Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. But am I having a great day? That's always the question. Uh, I'd say 99.9% of the time I am, but right now, my most hated enemy has returned to this planet. Some people call it... I guess everyone calls it snow. I don't... Don't they say there's like 27... Like Eskimos have 27 different words for snow, but I couldn't think of... (laughs) <laughs> One extra word. Snow. I hate snow. Anyways, it's falling. It looks like it's going to be pretty slushy, so I'm not too worried about it. But anyways, let's go ahead and get started with the episode. Now, this first story we're going to look at is from that magical year of 2004. Yes, we're delving back into the new news folder, but this particular article is still happening today. Very, very interesting thing. Probably more interesting if you're a woman. And equally interesting if you're a man who likes watching women have orgasms. I guess that was a weird way to put it. But anyway, so back in 2004, there was a doctor named Dr. Stuart Malloy. Now, he was a, like, a, so he was a pain specialist. And one of the things he used to treat pain was they would put electrodes in your back and you just, eat, eat. you wouldn't make the noise. It would actually, like, electrocute you. Generally, most of the time that he did this, your back pain would go away. You're like, hey, thanks, doc. Take off. Back pain would be good for a bit. Little electrotherapy. But one time, this woman was having a particular pain in a particular point in her spine. So he puts the electrodes in, turns it on. Tell me when you feel something. And the woman starts hyperventilating. Uh, uh, Well, maybe it wasn't that exaggerated. And I don't think you guys want to hear me simulate a woman's orgasm, but... Or maybe you do. But anyway, so he's turning on the... Upping the ampage or the voltage, whatever it is. He probably should know because he's ejecting into a woman's body. Uh, uh, (laughs) Sounds like a dying duck. But anyways, she starts hyperventilating, making all these noises. And the doctor's like, whoa, 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 what's that? He shuts it off. And he's like, are you okay? And her response is, quote, you're going to have to teach my husband how to do that. Because she straight up started having an orgasm. Just like out of the blue. You're sitting in a doctor's office. One of the least sexy places. Unless you have a fetish for that thing. She starts having an orgasm. What he realized was that at that point in the spine. If you put these electrodes in there. And you turn it on. For a woman at least. You'll have an orgasm. Now obviously. Like you can imagine the doctor standing there. And like little money signs. Little dollar signs appearing in his eyeballs. He's like da-ching. He actually heard the sound effect. That was real. That was in the article. I heard a sound effect and my eyes turned to two dollar signs. Because immediately he's like, I'm sitting on a million dollars here with this piece of technology, with this piece of information. If I can go around and start giving women instant orgasms. Because women, this shouldn't come as a shock to most of you unless you live your life watching pornography. Women can have a harder time reaching climax than a man. A man can get his... You know, ding-dong stuck in a donut, and he's fine. Like, any sort of friction. He's like, oh, this feels pleasurable, but for women, it can be a little more complicated. However, you can't start marketing a device that shoots electricity into people's bodies and just be like, ah, it'll help you get off. He had to package it as a medical device, and I can't believe I used the word ding-dong. But anyways, so he had to package it as a medical device. And so he was marketing it towards women who couldn't have orgasms, either through some sort of injury or some sort of psychological issue. Women who can't have orgasms, this device will help you do that. It is a medical device. And he's tested it on women who have kind of fit that pattern where, you know, they just can't have, they've never had an orgasm or they physically or mentally can't have an orgasm because of some incident. So he does like a small study, and I believe there was like 11 women involved, and 10 of them had orgasms using that machine. And one of the women was sad when the study ended, because she's like, oh, I 
can't have orgasms normally. I really want this machine. Now, it's controlled. You put the electrodes in your back, and it's controlled by a remote control. And I'll tell you right now, do not lose that remote control. Because if someone else gets a hold of that thing, you're going to have a really fun but very, very sore afternoon. So you make sure, like, you mu- you'd have to keep that, like, on your key keychain. And you're like, where's my car? And you're trying to turn it on. You're like, oh, uh, in the parking lot. Which would be quite interesting to see. The problem is, there was two problems. One, the mach- the device, because you have to have it implanted. You have to have the little electrode things plugged in your spine. That procedure cost $17,000. And the doctor's like, oh, I have no doubt in my mind that women will pay $17,000 to be able to give themselves instant orgasms with this machine. But the bigger problem is that we're in the year 2014 now, so 10 years later, he's still trying to get this made as a medical device. He has to do a full trial for the FDA. And to do that, you need a ton of people, and you need a bunch of researchers, and you need like you need to buy like a thousand lab coats, because I'm sure they're going to get dirty at some point. And the FDA required, like for this study, the cost is $6 million to be able to run a full study so that the FDA can look at all your results. And say, yeah, this works. And he can't, he's trying to raise the money, he can. As of 2014, he wasn't able to raise the money. And that was kind of the latest information I'd seen on this. So, if you happen to have $6 million sitting around, don't know what to do with it. And you're like, you know what, I have all this money, but zero orgasms. I'd rather have all these orgasms and zero money. You can donate it to this guy. Get a little, uh, you know, get the full trial run. Make sure it's totally healthy. FDA stamps it. You'll be the first one with two little electrodes in your back. And a little remote control in your hand. You're just walking down the street. That would be so weird. You're, you're like sitting on the bus. And you're just, you know, reading your book. And you hear like a... Because a, you'd have to learn how to stifle the vocals. But you hear like a... Ugh, and you look over and you see a woman just completely tense up. And then go completely noodle. Just completely relax. She's just sitting on the bus. You'd be like, what? And you'd start seeing that throughout the day. You'd be at the office... You'd be a se- watching the secretary sitting there. She's talking, and all of a sudden, uh? And then just go noodle everywhere. Brave new world, my friends. Brave new world. So our next story is a request from two different listeners. We have on YouTube, uh, Caesar Pizza 133 And then through email, we have Jeremy. So both recommended this story. Now, the story itself is a corruption story, and it's quite... By the book. But when we look at the details and the ramifications going forward, it actually is a win for conspiracy theorists. And I'm surprised they don't bring this up more often. So we're going to South Korea. We are going to take, we're not, we, the dead rabbit dirigible, that, we'll leave that for a while. But let's go ahead and hop into the carpenter copter. I have a special buffer. I have like a special EMP around it so your orgasm remote controls won't work. So I don't have to worry about you going all noodly in the back. Anyways, so we're going the long way, so we don't fly over North Korea. We will be going there for future episodes, but land, we get out South Korea. A little too close to the DMZ. We did catch some fire, but it's okay. It's okay. North Koreans missed us. I think they were just I think they were just trying to get some attention. But so now we're in South Korea. And the year is 2016. And this whole story broke. On something super mundane. There's a private college. Very, very wealthy kids are going there. And it's very competitive. And the other kids are telling their parents, this girl, she never shows up, ever shows up to any of the lessons. She always passes. It's not fair. It's not fair. And so people using their connect. this went on for a while and people using their connections were like, you know, you might want to look into this because we know that girl knows her mother's a pretty important person. There might be something kind of corruption thing going on here. So reporters started looking into this daughter who attends this college and they did find out that things were not on the up and up. Now, the daughter's mother is a woman named Choi Soon Sil and she is the daughter herself, because that's how families work, of a cult leader. This cult was known as the Church of Eternal Life. Very, very popular in South Korea, but still a cult. They weren't like this mainstream thing. And it was a mix of Christianity, Buddhism, and shamanism. So they believed a lot in the spiritual world, contacting the dead, things like that. So they're thinking, okay, maybe the cult's pulling some ties. Maybe they're talking to the college president. Because 
even powerful people, they want their kids to learn. They're not going to go that far off the reservation where they're like, oh, yeah, no, I don't care if my kid doesn't even show up. Just make sure they all get A's. So reporters are looking into this. And then they discover something deeply troubling. Choi Soon Sil is controlling elements of the leadership of the college through the president of South Korea. The president of South Korea at that time was Park Goon Hee, actually the first female president in South Korea history. Her father was previously president, and her mother was killed in an assassination attempt against her father. And then a few years later, her father was assassinated, successfully assassinated. So Park, I'll just call her Park, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the other name, but Park is a total orphan at this point. Now, she's a young kid at this point when her parents are killed, and she has no one. She was friends with the daughter of the cult, and she's just kind of brought into it. And over the years, they kind of orchestrated her return to power, knowing full well that when she became president, they would rule the country. At this point, where we're at in 2016, Choi Soon Sil runs the cult. Her father has passed away as well. So you have Choi Soon Sil, and then you have Park as president, and together they pretty much ran the country. This was all discovered because her daughter wasn't attending classes. And when the news got out, massive protests. Protests of over one million people. It just was this insane thing. You had this president who was being controlled by the equivalent. She wasn't like a Jonestown level cult. But it would be the equivalent of, say, a weirdo street preacher who just happens to have a bunch of followers. Like, it wasn't an acceptable version of religion in South Korea. It was still a cult. And the South Korean people felt betrayed by the president, and they felt tricked by this cult leader. She was considered, uh, Choi Soon Sil was considered a modern-day Rasputin, the way she just kind of pulled strings. I remember reading one report that... One time, the president went up, President Park went up to give a speech, and the reporters were like, why is she wearing those clothes? She looks kind of dumpy in that outfit. Like, that's kind of a weird outfit for a president to wear doing a speech. Now, she wasn't dressed in, like, rags. She wasn't a hobo with a bindle, you know, smoking a big corn cob pipe. But it was out of character for her, and it was out of character for someone of that stature. The rumor was, was that she was being punished. And Choi Soon Sil said, you know what, you're not doing what we said, or you're being disrespectful. Wear these hobo clothes, wear these poor people clothes, these non-designer clothes, the next time you give a speech. She was under that level of control from the cult. The cult's gone by names also as Eight Goddesses. That's really, Eight Goddesses scandal was kind of how it was known in Western media. It's a very evocative term. But the end result was, protest happened. Choi gets sentenced to 20 years in prison for corruption. Park, the president, gets sentenced to 24 years for corruption. And Choi soon still had to pay $17 million in fines because she had all the money from her cult. Now, fairly basic corruption story with a simply an added element of a shaman and a cult and this religious belief system and things like that. On its face, you're like, okay, you know, I've heard of politicians being corrupt i've heard of people being bribed and things like that so this one just has kind of an added supernatural element to it but the reason why i think this is important as a story is that it's a conspiracy that is true we can take that and this is why i'm surprised it's not bigger news in the west you have that and it's provable and so why don't more conspiracy theorists say, well, look at this happened in South Korea and we know what's happening. So who's to say that the same thing isn't happening here with this other group? Like it's a anytime you can find an actual provable conspiracy theory, especially something along these lines where it is a religious cult controlling the highest person in the country. Why isn't it used more in Western culture in Western conspiracy culture? This is my theory. It's too mundane. Western conspiracy culture, and I don't want to go off on a rant here, but Western conspiracy culture has really gotten super bizarre recently. I think it's too mundane for them. They don't want to have one group controlling one person because they can take this evidence and go, hey, look, here we have this cult that was controlling the president. So maybe this cult was controlling Obama. But they don't want that. They want this huge overarching conspiracy 
where the Queen of England and George Soros and Obama and Hillary Clinton and all these Katy Perry is in, in, in on it somehow. Katy Perry and Kevin Spacey are at the same level of Barack Obama and George Soros in, in this weird mind of theirs. It's this huge net that comes around the world. And so it's too ridiculous. If you want to tell a good conspiracy theory, you keep it simple. To say that Henry Kissinger and Rihanna have meetings and they're like, you know what we need to do? We need to push more sexy young women on the people of the world. That does, It doesn't make any sense. Pedo would and the Hollywood elite and the reptilians and the demons and stuff like that. It's way too, uh, way too unwieldy. And they all end up like that. The reason why it gets so weird like that and so big, because it's mostly made up. It's mythology. It's really, conspiracy theory is modern day mythology. And, and just like myths of old, everyone kind of picks and chooses what's, what they want and they deform the story and turn it into their vision. And then they put it out there and someone picks and chooses from what they want and it builds this mythology. Reality, I love a good myth, and I love a great story, but reality, like this story right here, is more interesting because it happened. And that was it. And, and it's super bizarre that this doesn't get brought up more in, in conspiracy theory circles. A provable conspiracy theory, the most powerful person in the country, was under the thrall of a cult leader who believed she could talk to the dead. Dude, that should be a conspiracy theorist's wet dream. They wouldn't need the Orgasmatron if they listened to this one. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our last story. Out in the darkness of space, a planet explodes. <laughs> Except there's no noise in space, so you just see a bunch of rocks fly away. I guess if you were on the planet when it exploded, it would be quite loud. And there's a frozen chunk of it creening through the darkness. Flying, who knows where, but we know where. Because millions of years later, this giant, frozen block of an alien planet crashes into Earth's oceans. <laughs> All the single-celled organisms are like, what the hell was that? Oh no, we're evolving. I'm a dog. Hey, look at me, I'm a cat. That's a little bit of a overview of it. Simplification. But what we're doing right now is we're looking at the conspiracy theory. It is a conspiracy theory that some scientists agree with and others don't. And it's interesting because it's kind of set up on different levels. This one was actually requested on YouTube by Waffenbear. He wanted me to cover this one. So where life came from on Earth, what we can do is we can look back to the Cambian era where we saw this massive explosion in advanced life. And most of the modern species that are here today, we can trace back to the Cambian era. Before that, it was just a bunch of little amoebas like dancing around on the planet, having a good time. It was like the movie Flubber, but it was just all just goo. Goo hanging out. And at some point, something happened that caused life to just explode. Now, an idea of that is this thing called panspermia which I think that's how you pronounce it, where life is seeded from other planets, that somehow something came from another planet and helped advance life here. That's not super... The panspermia thing is a bit... Um, I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing that, but the panspermia thing is kind of debatable, but science goes there was this big explosion of life at this certain point of time. Now, Waffenbear, who suggested this, is looking at a actual article written by 33 science in particular this was quite recently wrote this they're saying yes oh cambrian not cambian but anyways the cambrian explosion happened that's all fine but when we look at the octopus when we look in its big eyes i think it has two of them and it's not squirting ink at us we're like look out <laughs> Their lab coats are all covered in black now. Why don't they wear black lab coats or like red lab coats or something like that? In Star Trek, the doctors wear red. Not their uniforms, but their medical. Oh, never mind, never mind. So anyways, the 
These 33 scientists recently released a report, and it was in the Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology Journal. Peer-reviewed article, by the way, saying that they had a different theory when it comes to the octopus. Well, I thought the plural of octopus was octopi, but anyways, when you look at the octopus, you go, it has a bunch of evolutionary advantages that it's previous, that nothing had previous to that. They had the ability to camouflage and change shape almost instantly to hide themselves. It was a brand new evolutionary advantage. Large brains, also a huge advantage that was not seen previous to the octopus. A sophisticated nervous system, camera-like eyes, which I don't really know what that means, but I'm assuming it's some sort of eye that's just more advanced. Rather than your lame eyes over there, dude, the octopus is looking at the squid and being like, dancing, dancing so fast, the squid's like, I don't know what, see, what I'm looking at. I don't have camera-like eyes, little GoPro eyes. So this is the theory that was put forth by these scientists in this journal. So what their idea is this? Because the octopus showed up after the Cambrian explosion, according to these guys. So their theory is this, that a chunk from another planet was frozen with octopus eggs, that they are literally an alien species on this planet. They are did not evolve on Earth. And this chunk of octopus eggs crashed into the ocean and they hatched. And that's where the octopus comes from. Now, obviously, there's debate about that. The interesting thing is the debate the infra- like the debates I've seen, at least in the articles that I read, aren't the best. When the scientists who wrote the report, they said, you know, the there's a huge the octopus genome is very, very complex. And thirty three this is weird, thirty three shown up a lot in here. Ooh, conspiracy, uh uh. Maybe the octopi are the Illuminati. The Illuma the the Illuma Inky, maybe. There was a long pause there. If I edited that down, I had to think about that one for a while. Octopus genome is very complex. with over 33,000 protein coding genes, which is more than is present in a, in a human. And a lot of the articles, they're like, you know, like the debunking articles, they're like, you know, they say that it's complex, but, you know, we've decoded the genome, so it can't be alien. But I'm thinking, why couldn't you decode an alien genome? Like, and every article that was debunking it kind of had that same phrase. And they're admitting, hey, we know what the genome is of this alien octopus. There's no argument about that. They're just saying it's more complex than human. And the pushback's like, what? We've decoded it. And they don't really go into detail. The, one of the best debunking articles I read said that if an octopus from another planet came here, it wouldn't be able to evolve from the squid unless there were also squids on the alien planet. So whether or not it was straight up like eggs coming in on the comet or asteroid, or that whatever came down somehow mutated existing squids, the pushback to that was you would have to have a squid on another planet, like like a descendant of a squid on another planet for it to be able to mutate or breed with the squids down here. That's fair. That's a fair pushback. But again, that's really not what the scientists are saying. They're straight up saying octopus eggs came from another planet. Now, I know this is getting messy because I keep going back and forth, but, you know, they did this journal. It was in a peer-reviewed journal, and so that gives them a bit of credibility. However, I can start a journal with my... I don't know the pedigree of the Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology journal. We'll assume it's decent. Oh, and another pushback was like, there is no zoologist in the 33 scientists, so we should just throw out the whole study. It's really bizarre that the disagreements with this paper are pretty, at least the ones that are being quoted in news articles, are pretty weak, actually. What if what started the Cambrian explosion was panspermia? was rocks of life flying from other planets to come here. But it was just like, I don't know, gene juice. It was just like little bits and pieces of alien dudes. Like they got blown up, their skin fell everywhere, and then their skin fall. I 
I guess I should let you guys know now. I don't know what I'm talking about. So let's skip that part. Here's the thing. This is my pushback to this. The fact that an alien egg could be frozen on an asteroid and crash on Earth, I really don't have any problem with that. I could see that happening. It would be one in a million that it would survive. Like, it would be frozen at the right temperature and wouldn't melt too close as it got close to any sun as it was flying around and then crashed in the water and survived the impact and all this stuff. But one in a million chances in a universe that's infinite and time that's infinite is going to happen. I would think it was weird that an alien, let's say the Cambrian life explosion was going on and you started to have all these sea creatures evolve and land creatures evolve and a creature shows up that is not only slightly related to other creatures that are currently there, but dude, wait a second. Oh, man, I just thought of something. This isn't in the article, so you'll have to forgive me if I go off the uh, science, the quote-unquote science talk for a second. What if it's true? What if it is an octopi, an octopus is an alien life form? But it wasn't by chance that they look like, that they're like related to a squid. What if it's by choice? What if it's by some sort of design? Like, what came down was the matrix for some sort of life form. And it took the makeup of existing of an existing creature in its environment, one of the best ones, which would be a giant squid, and then added in its own... Basically, what I'm basically trying to explain is some sort of shape-shifting alien but more like it can adapt its if if that comet had landed on land we may had we have, may have had a four-legged creature like a dog type of thing but with more learning capability it could instantly camouflage it could change its shape and things like that like what if i mean that's science fiction this uh, let's go back to the article just to reaffirm it real quick Scientists, some scientists believe that an asteroid crashed into the Earth and it had octopus eggs on it. So octopi are an actual alien species. But the, the, the th- we could we could extrapolate that to say that it could have just not been on accident. It, where it landed determined what it would look like and the advantages that it would have. Because it landed in the ocean. Basically, I guess what I'm explaining is when an Autobot crash lands on Earth and they scan the nearest car, they can become that car. Because we're, once we're in the realm of... Wh- why not? Why not? What if the octopus is not an accidental hitchhiker, but an intentional resident? You know, the only reason why the octopus is not one of the most advanced species on the planet, because they're incredibly smart. They can learn things by watching people. They're very, very smart. The only thing that limits them to not becoming a dominant life form on the planet is that they only live to be five years old. A lot of them die after mating. So if they lived longer, if they lived as long as a blue whale, they actually would be the dominant species of the ocean. And it's funny to think that there is a possibility in a world where the octopus lived longer, let's say 60, 70 years, I don't think humans would have control of the oceans. I think once we first started sailing out across the oceans, I think boats would just be disappearing all the time. Because that's their land. And we it's totally inhospitable to humans. The, you can't drink the water. You'll drown in it. You gotta build, build something to go across it. But if a just a little twist in the genome where the octopus lives as long as a human. There is a world where the continents are completely separated. Like other than the Bering land bridge, there'd be nobody on the Americas and everyone would just be where they're at. There'd be no international trade. Because every time you send a ship out, it would crash. And you would just be like, well, I guess there's monsters out there. And then as society did develop and we started to uh, do science stuff. I mean, think about it. The America's not being found until the invention of the plane. 
is what would happen in a world where the octopus simply everything's the same. They just simply lived a little longer. This wouldn't be our planet. It would just parts of it would be. You'd have a totally different advanced species controlling two thirds of the planet. You know, we talked about gray aliens and dolphins the other day. And it was a theory. But but the idea that if octopuses just lived a little longer, they would basically we would be the tr- we would be the ones. Dude, what if they, what if they, fished for us? They'd outnumber us probably. They'd control more of the world's surface. A world where octopi, eight arms, are sneaking into your bedroom at night. Mommy, I think there's a monster under my bed. When a kid said that, the parents would be like, oh my god, there's an octopus in here. Because you'd have to believe it, because octopi are constantly climbing into the surface, grabbing you, ripping your guts out. Whether or not the octopus is from another planet, we don't really know. Some scientists say yes, some scientists say no. But wherever they're from, with just a little switch, they could have been the dominant life form on this planet. We could have been the ones that were their food supply. They don't need, I mean, they can walk on land. We could have no coastal cities, no ports. Because at night, these eight armed creatures would come up and grab a little bite to eat. Maybe they would just do it for fun on the weekends. It's weird to think how the world works, like how science works, how those little things can make big differences. Is it possible that the octopus is actually an alien life form from another planet? It is possible. And I think the arguments that are being used against it are relatively weak, which makes me think we don't have to look to the stars to find alien life. The stars already came to us. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Jason O. Carpenter. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one.